This is a video on nested intervals. So what are these things? So let's let I1, I2, we're just enumerating these intervals, I with a subscript of a natural number. Let's say that these are intervals that satisfy the following kind of containment relationship. So I1's the biggest, the next biggest is I2, and so on down the list. So these intervals are shrinking a little bit smaller and smaller inside of each other. And I tried to draw you a picture of that down here. I1's the biggest one, I2's contained in it, I3's contained in those two, and so on. We'll say that this is a sequence of nested intervals here. I've drawn them with parentheses there. They could have parentheses and brackets, some combination of the two, doesn't matter. So the nested part, again, is this um, containment relationship here. So let me give you some concrete examples of some nested intervals. So let's say I n has this form, zero to one over n. So that's where this is trying to tell you a formula for what each member of the sequence looks like. And so uh, this is a sequence of nested intervals. I tried to draw you a few. So I one would be just the whole set from zero to one. Um, I2 would just be the set from 0 to 1 half, and yes, 0 to 1 half is contained in 0 to 1. And then I3 would be 0 to a third, etc. And I tried to draw you a picture of them down here. Now what we want to look at, or what's an interesting question about these intervals, is is there anything in common to all of them? What's the intersection of all the INs? And in this case, maybe it's not too hard to believe, the only thing that's in every single one of these INs would be the number 0 itself which maybe isn't too hard to believe again, since there's the first one, the next one's this one, and what are we doing? As we go farther and farther out with the index here, we see that we're just shrinking lower and lower and lower. Maybe it makes sense that eventually, I'm just gonna run into the origin itself, or to zero itself. So how come though, how would you do that a little bit more formally? What if you took a positive number x? Well, what do I know from a consequence of the Archimedean property? You can always find a natural number whose reciprocal is closer to zero than x is. Well, what does that mean then? That means that x cannot be a member of this interval from 0 to that number 1 over n. Well, if x isn't in that 1, then there's no way it's in all of the ins, right? You just found me a particular in that x is not a member of, therefore x cannot be in all the ins. So what did that show? Well, that shows that there's no positive numbers that are in these ins. Since each of these i's are positive, right, you never go to the left of 0. That's how you can conclude that 0 is in fact the only number in all of them. Let me give you another example of these JNs, and all I've done is I've changed this to parentheses here. That's again a sequence of nested intervals, but maybe what's not too hard to believe. From above, right, I already know that there's no positive numbers that are in all of them, but now zero's not in there either, right, since it's always a parenthesis on the left. Therefore, the intersection of these is empty. Maybe that's kind of badly behaved. So what I want to tell you about is the nested intervals property or theorem. If you have a a sequence of nested closed intervals, so these brackets here, then you can expect to have a point in common to all of them. There should be a point in their intersection. The intersection should never be empty. So there exists a point here. Now, I'm saying that there's at least one point here, right? I'm not saying there's more, I'm not saying there's exactly one quite yet. So this isn't quite as strong as what we're gonna do in a little bit. How would you prove such a thing here? So what you would do is, why don't I look at the set of all these left endpoints A N? that thing's gotta be bounded above by B1. So let me come up here and draw you a picture. How come? What am I saying to you? In my picture, here's B1, and I'm saying, look at all these left endpoints. Oh yeah, they're always to the left of B1, right? Since uh, they don't, yeah, they don't go any further. So if I go back down, sorry if that gave you a little motion sickness there. So AN has to be, oh, I'm sorry, since, so, so this set is bounded above, that means it's supremum exists. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna let this Greek letter Xi be the supremum of the left endpoints. So since it's the supremum, that means it's an upper bound. In fact, it's the least upper bound, but in particular, Xi is always larger than all your ANs. So what we're gonna try to do is show that BN, every single BN is larger than Xi. So how we'll do that, what we'll do is for a particular n, we're gonna show that bn is always an upper bound for this set of these of left endpoints, where I've just used a different letter just not to make you think that bn has to match this left endpoint. I'm saying that each bn, b1, is an upper bound for all the left endpoints. Similarly, b2 is an upper bound for all the left endpoints, is what this is trying to say. Why would that be good? Well, if each b is an upper bound for the left endpoints, remember xi is the least upper bound, therefore xi has to be smaller than or equal to bn. So how would you do that? Well, there's two things that could happen, right? Either n is less than or equal to k, in which case the interval i n contains the interval i k, which I've drawn for you over to the left. And what are you looking at? All I really care about is that a k is right here, and it's definitely to the left of b n. 
So AK is less than or equal to BN. And remember, that's what I'm going for. That says that BN is an upper bound for those AKs. Now, what's the other case then? The other case is, what if N is larger than K? In that case, IK is the larger interval. So IK contains IN. And if you look at my picture over there, well, if IK contains IN, all I really care about is, again, AK is still to the left of BN. And that's really what I care about right here. So either way, you always have that AK is less than or equal to BN. Therefore, BN is an upper bound for all the left endpoints. And by above, that means that psi has to be less than or equal to BN. And that's the end of the proof for that. Now, in that part, right, I just said that there existed a point in common to all the nested closed intervals, right? How do you know if you get exactly one? And so one way to see if you get exactly one is if you have this extra condition here that the infimum of the length of each individual interval has to be zero. So those are all say, shrinking. Um, then in that case, there exists a unique, so remember that exclamation point is a symbol for, there's a unique point xi that's in every single one of them. So how would you prove this very quickly? I already know that xi exists by the previous, uh, previous result, the nested intervals property that we just proved. So all we're gonna do is try to show that it's unique. And we're gonna do something kind of similar. Let's let the Greek letter nu be the infimum of all the right endpoints. So what we're gonna try to do then, or, or wait a minute before I get into that, well, nu is the infimum of all the right endpoints. That tells me then that all the left endpoints have to be smaller than or equal to nu, right? So nu is in some sense like the smallest that a right endpoint could be, therefore all the left endpoints have to be smaller than that as well. Now, I already know that xi is the least upper bound for all the left endpoints, therefore xi has to be less than or equal to nu. So what just happened? This says that nu is an upper bound for all the left ones, xi is the least upper bound for all the left ones, therefore xi is less than or equal to nu. Now what we're gonna do is, if I subtract xi to the other side, I get that nu minus xi is some positive number, but in particular, that tells me that nu minus xi cannot be a lower bound for the length of my nested intervals. How come? Because I know that zero was the infimum. Zero was the greatest lower bound. So what does that tell me then? So that means that for any epsilon bigger than zero, for any real number that you pick, you should be able to find an index, a natural number m, such that nu minus xi is less than b minus m minus am, which is smaller than epsilon. And now what I really wanna focus on with this inequality here, this is a lot to digest, so maybe think about that, but what I really wanna focus on is, we just said for any epsilon that nu minus xi is between zero and epsilon. And that should work for any epsilon. And remember we had a result uh, earlier in the class where if that happens, that tells you that the thing between zero and epsilon itself has to be zero. So nu minus xi has to be equal to zero. Now move xi over. That says nu and xi have to be equal. So the infimum of the right endpoints has to equal the uh, supremum of the left endpoints. Well, what if you had a point in common to all of these? How does that happen? Well, that point has to be between the supremum of the left endpoints and the infimum of the right endpoints. Well, if those two on the right, left and on the right are the same number, how is x between them? x has to equal that number. So what we just showed is that x, any point in between all of them, has to just be xi itself, since xi is equal to nu. Okay, so the last application I wanna tell you about for this nested interval stuff comes back to uh, countable sets and uncountable sets. So recall that a set A is called countable if there's a bijection from the natural numbers to A. And to say a little bit more about that, what would that mean? That would mean that you can enumerate the elements of A. You could say that the first element of A, we'll just call it f of one. I'll say A2 is f of two. So we could again enumerate the elements of this set here. So what we're gonna show is that R, the real numbers, not a countable set, it's uncountable. And how we're gonna do that, it suffices to show that the interval from zero to one is not countable because then any set containing zero to one isn't countable either. In particular, R would not be countable. So how do we show zero to one is not countable? Well, by way of contradiction, let's suppose that it is. So if it's countable, kind of like I'm trying to say to you up here in red, you should be able to actually list out its elements and, and enumerate them. So I'll say that the elements of zero to one are the elements x1, x2, xn, and so on. So I could list them all out just like that. Now, what we're gonna do with the rest of the game is, is we're gonna make some kind of neat nested intervals. 
So we're going to let I1 be some closed interval that's just contained inside of 0, 1, such that though I1 does not contain maybe this first point x1 right here. I'm going to make I2. I2 is going to be a subinterval of I1, so it's contained in I1, so I'm getting this nested property, such that though I2 does not contain the next point, x2. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to keep building these the sequence of these intervals like that, right? Where IN does not contain XN, just like we've done up here. I1 does not contain X, uh, X1, I2 does not contain X2. I'm going to keep doing this. So uh, what do we have then? I've got this sequence of nested intervals, and they're all contained inside of here, and they're all closed. So I should be able to apply the nested interval theorem, which tells me that there needs to exist a point that's in every single one of the intervals that I've that I have uh, that I've made for you. And in particular, right, that point xi, it should be an element of 0, 1. It's not some other real number, right? So all these intervals are contained in 0, 1. Therefore, xi should be in 0, 1 as well. Well, wait a minute. We just said that uh, all the ins, right, in never contains xn. So xi can never ever be one of the xns ever. Why is that bad? Why is that a contradiction? Well, xi is supposedly in 0, 1, and we suppose that we could enumerate them. In other words, any element of 0, 1 should be an xn. But we just found an element of 0, 1 that cannot be an xn. And that's a contradiction to the fact that we cannot, that contradicts that we thought that we could enumerate the set 0, 1. So in fact, we cannot enumerate the set from 0 to 1. So therefore, 0 to 1 is uncountable. Just to show you a little picture, what did that proof do? So in the first step, I had this... Uh, interval from 0 to 1. And what I'm doing is I'm going to pick, let's say that the first point here is x1, let's say it's this guy right here. Well, I'm going to pick i1 to be this close set right here. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to, I just I'll keep drawing on this one actually. So now let's say that x2 is say this point right here, who knows. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to say, well, i2 needs to be inside of i1 and it doesn't want to have x2 either. So that's maybe how I'm building these intervals of, of these i's.